been studying about the church and thank the Lord he has made you to be a part of the leadership to make the church as strong as the church ought to be you need to pray as the choirs um, offer that prayer on our behalf you close your eyes and say to the Lord order my steps in your word dear Lord lead me guide me every day send your anointing father I pray order my steps in your word humbly I ask thee teach me thy will while Satan is at work wanting to destroy the church be at work in my heart in my life in my ministry order my steps in your word father we thank you because we know you are doing that already and we pray lord that you guide us you lead us you order our steps in jesus name Amen. help us to do your work acceptably well help us to do the work in a way it will profit your own church in a little corner in a big corners lord we pray that your anointing will work mightily in every one of our hearts and lives in jesus name once again, Lord, we plead. Once again, we ask. Once again, we pray. Order our steps. Let this work prosper in our hands in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. As I've repeated in every message, we're going through a series. And it's a series on the church. The Lord is building the church. If the Lord alone were to build the church, without our participation, without our involvement, without taking part in the work, it would have been a perfect church from beginning to the last. But because we build us together with him, we are workers together with him. Many times our human frailty, our human shortcoming, our human lack contributes to the state of the church not immediately made perfect. As you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, reading there from verse 9, it says in verse 9, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. We're laboring with the Lord, walking with the Lord. And because we're involved, that's why sometimes we see the blemishes and we see the incompetencies and we see the frailty in the church. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. The Lord Jesus told John the Beloved on the Isle of Patmos to write these letters, these epistles, short though they are, yet full of meaning and full of instruction to write to the churches in Asia Minor, seven of them, seven representing completeness, fullness, perfection. It was a write to the church in Ephesus, in Smyrna, in Pergamos, in Tatira, in Sardis, in Philadelphia, in Laodicea seven of them and we have seen that the series of messages were preaching on the church at this time we start with number one a fundamental church 
in a pluralistic world. Number two, a fearless church in a persecuting world. Number three, a faltering church in a perverted world. And number four, a feeble church in a putrefying world. Number five, a formal church in a perishing world. Number six, a faithful church in a pessimistic world. Number seven, is a flattered church. A church that flattered itself. A flattered church in a permissive world. And in every one of those churches of age, the Lord Jesus, the builder of the church, the cornerstone of the church said, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. And then he gives a promise to the overcomer. And so we'll be concluding everything with the overcomers and the promised eternal world. We now come to the church in Tatira. As we come to this church, we're looking at Revelation chapter 2. Reading there from verse 18. And unto the angel of the church in Tatira write. This thing says the Son of God. Who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire. And his feet are like fine brass. Every time we have endeavored to show why the Lord Jesus Christ will refer to the leader. To the pastor. To the overseer to the minister to the shepherd in the church as the angel of the church if you turn your bible to first samuel chapter 29 for samuel chapter 29 you have a glimpse of the reason why leaders in the church today are referred to by jesus christ himself that we are the angels in the church of the church in 1 Samuel chapter 29, I'm reading verse 8 and the first part of verse 9. 1 Samuel chapter 29, verse 8. And David said unto Achish, But what have I done? And what hast thou found in thy servant? So long as I have been with thee unto this day that I may not go to fight against the enemies of my Lord the King. As we look at this, David was saying, My Lord the King has enemies. And I'm going, I want to fight in the battle of the Lord, of my Lord the King. Apply that to us. Our King is Christ. Our Savior is Christ. Our Lord is Christ. He has an enemy. His name is Satan, the devil. He's holding in captivity the people that Jesus Christ died for. And so we get involved in the battle of the Lord and we are the servants and the soldiers in the army of our Lord, the King, King Jesus. And those of us who are in leadership over the army of the Lord, over a little army there in the house fellowship, a little army there in the zone, a little army there in the local government, a little army there in the region, a state army there in the state, and national army there as national overseers. We are fighting the battles of the Lord. And then look at this in verse 9. Achish answered and said unto David, I know that thou art good in my sight as an angel of God. I know that you are good. You have a good heart. You have a good intention. You have a good purpose too. You have a good plan. And because those of us who are set over the church, the local church, the visible church, the militant church, the church at war against the devil, we have good hearts and good intention and good calling, a great calling. That's why the Lord Jesus refers to us in every, every church. He says, you are the angel of the church. We're coming back to Revelation chapter 2. In verse 18, unto the angel of the church in Tatira. The angel of the church. When we say the church, already we know it's ecclesia in Greek. It's a called out people. But when the Lord calls us out, before we were called, we were sinners. 
after he called us and cleansed us and converted us and saved us and forgave us and purchased us and turned us around we became saints and so the church is the congregation of saints look at the bible psalm 1 psalm 1 i'm reading there from verse 5 in psalm 1 verse 5 it says therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous the church is the congregation of the righteous we're saved to be righteous. We're set apart unto righteousness. He calls us out of sin, out of degradation, out of evil, out of defilement. And we're saved because of that. We become the church or the congregation of the righteous. I'm looking at Psalm 89. In Psalm 89, we're reading here from verse 5. The church, the congregation, the congregation of the saints. Psalm 89, verse 5. And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. That's the church. In the congregation of the saints. And so then as Jesus comes and he sends a letter, he sends an epistle, he sends a message to this church in Tatira. We find that they had not lived up to the privilege of their calling. The privilege of becoming or being the congregation of the righteous or the congregation of the saints. It goes on to say, I'm, I'm reading now in Revelation chapter 2 verse 18. And unto the angel of the church in Tatira, right. As we look at these the churches in Asia Minor, many of the churches you don't find their names in the, in, the, uh, in the epistles. Neither do you find them particularly mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles. But a few of them are, like the church in Ephesus that's mentioned, like the church in, uh, the, the church in uh, Tatira that's mentioned also, and the church in Laodicea that's mentioned. But the other people, the others are not particularly mentioned. Let's look at Acts of the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16. I'm reading here from verse 14. It says, And a certain woman named Lydia is still a purple of the city of Tatira. So you find that there was this a good woman, righteous woman, saintly woman, holy woman in this, in this city. And then we're told, after she became born again, which worship God had us, whose heart the Lord opened. That she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized, she was saved. And she was baptized. It says, her, and her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. So we find that a righteous woman, saved woman in the church in Tatira. But somehow, her influence did not continue in that church. We're told, when good people keep quiet, evil thrives. Evil will occupy, will invade the whole place. When good people keep quiet, when righteous people keep quiet, if there's a Lydia in that church, she should raise up children like herself, converts like herself. And even if, she, even if she passes on, she should leave some people behind, some women behind that will keep on having good influence on the local church. Otherwise, when good women keep quiet, bad women or righteous women or saved women, licentious women will take over and their influence will not be something we want to continue in the church. We're coming back to Revelation chapter 2, and I'm looking at this in chapter 2, verse 18. And unto the angel of the church in Tatira, right. We're talking about a feeble church in a putrefying world. A putrefying world, a world that is going from bad to worse. 
a world that is not helping the state of the Christian faith, of the nature of the Christian faith. A putrefying world is described in Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. Reading from verse 6, this is what a purified world looks like. A world that is dirty and defiled. A world that is rotting. A world that is going from bad to worse. A world that is going from one level of evil to a deeper, higher, greater, extensive uh, area of evil. It says in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 6, From the sole of the foot, even unto the hedge, there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment, has not been treated. Look at verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. In verse 23, it tells us about the putrefication, about the condition, the evil condition of the world. It says, Thy princes are rebellious, we know that, and thy companions are thie of, of thieves. Then it says, Everyone loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither does the cause of the widow come unto them. In fact, uh, the Lord is saying that all over the world it's not going to become better, it's probably going to become worse. He tells us in Second Timothy chapter 3, Second Timothy chapter 3, the putrefying condition of this world in which we are, and that's where God has sent us to go and build a strong church, a sanctified church, a holy church, a righteous church, a church militant, a church triumphant. In Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. That's the world, putrefying, going from bad to worse. And yet Jesus had a church in that Tatira. And he has a church today in every corner of the world. And he still wants to have more churches everywhere, littering everywhere. Let's come, let's come now to this, um, to this letter, reaching to uh, the people over there, the church in Tatara. I'm reading from Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. And unto the church, and to the angel of the church in Tatara, write, The six says the Son of God, who has his eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, thy charity, and thy service, and, and faith, and, and thy patience, thy perseverance, and thy works again. You know, two times he mentions the works. And now he says, and the last to be, to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Notwithstanding, nevertheless, I have a few things against thee. You are laboring, you are active, you are up and doing, you are occupied. But I have a few things against thee. Wouldn't it be wonderful before the Lord comes and he tells us, he has a few things against us, that we examine our lives and we check up where are we in the Christian faith? Where are we in our spirituals? And where are we in the experience of the children of God? And get rid of those things that are negative, things that are sinful, and things that are righteous, and things that are defiling, and things that are polluting before he comes. I pray that we will be wise in Jesus' name. The church in Tatira had many good points for commendation. But the leader of that church, the angel of that church, the minister in that church, the shepherd, the pastor in that church, and the leadership team, they were tolerant of evil. They were so permissive that full-scale idolatry and full-scale immorality infected many lives without check and without control. The leadership allowed a self-appointed prophetess to teach false doctrine and to cause many to backslide be, be, without restraint and without discipline, without any challenge. Fear of man, fear of woman now, with corrupting influence, number one, silence them. The leadership of that judge became silenced because of the power and because of the, because of the personality, the posture of a Jezebel in that local church. It weakened their spiritual muscles that they couldn't fight the good fight of faith anymore. It distorted 
their perception of the holiness of God. It diverted their attention to pleasing people rather than pleasing God and pleasing God alone. It fixed their mind on avoiding present pain rather than escaping the eternal judgment and suffering that will come on compromises. A feeble church indeed because the leader was feeble. A feeble church indeed because the leadership team in that church was feeble. A feeble church indeed because even the membership in the church, they were feeble, feeble-minded, fake and fickle. Because of that, they couldn't fight the battle of the Lord. We're looking at this under three perspectives. Number one, commendation of progress by Jesus. Commendation of progress by Jesus. Number two, corruption through the perversion of Jezebel. Corruption through the perversion of Jezebel. Number three, command and promise for the just. Command and promise for the just. Number one is commendation. We're looking at Revelation chapter 2 verses 18 and 19. Revelation chapter 2 verses 18 and 19. It says unto the church, unto the angel of the church of the entire right. These things says the Son of God, who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, I know thy charity, I know thy service, I know thy faith, I know thy patience, I know thy works all over again, and the last to be more than the first. Christ introduced himself and established his authority before speaking to the church. He gave his divine credentials. He said, I am the son of God. He's not the son of man now. He's not talking about his humanity now. He's talking about his divinity. He's talking about his power, his authority, his judicial authority. Because he was going to send judgment there, that's why he introduced himself and he said, I am the son of God. That's his divinity and then his divine authority. He, he was not going to tolerate sin because this is the Alpha, this is the Omega, this is the mighty God, the almighty God. And because of that, he says, I'm going to deal with sin in the church of Tatira. It was an, is this angry deity talking in judgment severely. He's going to judge them severely. He has eyes like unto a flame of fire. And his feet are like fine brass. And then he goes on, he says, he has, uh, he has uh, a piercing, penetrating eye. And because of that, sin will not remain, will not escape his, his, uh, it will not escape his searching eyes. Evil or blemish cannot be veiled from his searching eyes. His eyes behold and his eyes penetrate and his eyes look at hidden things in, in the soul of everyone and in the church, wherever that church may be. His feet are, are strong. And they're ready to trample upon and trample down on repentant sinners in the church in Tatara and in the church anywhere in the world before revealing the terrible corruption uh, behind, uh, hidden behind and beneath their increasing works, increasing activities. The Lord commended them. He said, I know your charity. I know your love. Supposedly. That he is, he knows their love and the kind of love that makes them to be at least moderately active in the things of the and your service, sacrificial perhaps, and your faith and your patience and your works. He even said the last is more than the first. The Lord is always quick to commend virtue anywhere it is found. I'm sure you know that that doesn't excuse uh, the people that live in sin. It's like when he was talking to the woman at the well. And then, uh, you know, he said, uh, uh, go and call your husband. A woman said, I have no husband. He said, you've said the right thing. You, you told the truth. Commended her. That doesn't mean that the woman was saved at that time. And then when a lawyer came uh, asking, what's a good way that I will take to inherit the kingdom of God? Jesus said, do this, do this. And then he said, I've done all that. What, what remains? We're told that Jesus loved him. He loved him. And he said, this is what remains. And that person came to ask a question from the Lord. And then he said, it was the greatest commandment. And Jesus said, love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. 
And the man replied and said, Lord, that's the right answer. Because to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, that is, that is some total of everything. And Jesus said, thou art not far from the kingdom. You are not there yet, but you are not far. He commended him. And so Jesus always commends whatever good he can find in any individual and in any place too. But you know, all they had was love without holiness. And love without holiness will descend into immorality. We must love, yes, but must be holy as well. We must serve, but must be holy as well. We must be faithful with increasing perseverance, but the church must not be a hiding place for the corrupting influence of living of immorality and idolatry and uh, evil. And let, let's look at uh, Romans chapter 1 verses 3 and 4. As Jesus Christ introduced himself, he said, I am the son of God. And here we're told about Jesus Christ, Romans chapter 1. The introduction of Christ to this church in Tatira. Romans chapter 1 verse 3. Concerning the Son, His Son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and He says and declared to be the Son of God with power. Jesus Christ declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness that's why the lord jesus christ will not tolerate sin or evil immorality or idolatry in his church and then he comes he says the one that will judge he has feet of brass and he will trample down every form of evil and all the evil doers if they don't repent in john chapter 5 John chapter 5, we're reading here from verse 22. John chapter 5, verse 22. For the Father judges no man, but he has committed all judgment unto the Son. Would you know that the people that oppose Christ today, they'll come under the judgment of this Christ they oppose? Do you know that the people that fight against the building of the church and the establishment of the church and the growth of the church, whoever they are, and from whatever direction they are coming, it says that the Father has committed all judgment into his hand. Thank God we're not walking against Christ, we're walking with Christ. I said we're walking with Christ. We're going to escape the judgment of God in Jesus' name. In verse 25, it says, Very late, very late, I say unto you, the hour is coming. And now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Because of who he is, Son of Man, Son of God, he has committed all judgment into his hands. And one of these days, Christ is coming again. And when he comes, he'll bring judgment upon evil doers, that is, those who refuse to repent. Repentance gets you away from the judgment of God. Repentance shields you from the judgment of the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're looking at verses two at verses two and three. It says, We give thanks always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Why? Because we remember, we remember. Just like the Lord Jesus Christ referred to the good works of these people and their service and their patience, and he referred to the last works to be more than the false. The same thing for the Thessalonian believers. Paul the apostle was referring to them, he said, remembering without ceasing. Your work of faith and your labor of love and your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. And then these turners were growing. They were growing in their, in their love. That's their charity. They were growing in their faith. They were growing in their hope. They were growing in their labor. In First 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3. Just like the church in Thessalonica. Just like the church in Tyra, 
and they were also growing in their commitment to the Lord. I pray we will grow as well in our commitment to the Lord in Jesus' name. We're looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is me. Then it goes on to say, always we're doing that. Because that your faith groweth exceedingly. I pray that your faith will grow. Your labor will grow. Your love will grow. And what you do today will be more than what you ever did before this time in Jesus' name. Now, if the Lord Jesus commended the church in Tartyra and he said, your last works now, your present works now, they are more than the original, than the former things you did. If we come behind the, the, the church in, in, the, in this place, Tartyra, what commendation are we going to have? You'll not come behind in Jesus' name. Every day you see an addition to your commitment to the Lord. Every week you see a multiple, an addition to the work you are doing for the Lord. And every month and every year, she'll see you moving forward and doing more today than you did in the past. That's why it happened to them. That's how it will happen to us in Jesus' name. You do the work in a greater measure. You do the work in a better fashion. You do the work in a more spiritual way. That's why it says, because your faith groweth exceedingly and, and your charity, your love to everyone, everyone uh, of everyone of you toward each other abounded so that we we ourselves glory in you. We rejoice in you in the churches of God for your patience and your faith in all the persecutions and the tribulations that ye endure. So far, so good for this church. Let's come back to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. We're going to the next point now. Corruption through the perversion of Jezebel. Corruption through the perversion of Jezebel. Although there was a good woman there, Lydia, or if she had died, she had raised up other women too, but those other women were silenced. And I pray that you good women, righteous women, sanctified women in this church, you will not be silenced in Jesus' name. I Can I hear the women of the women? Because, you know, when you keep quiet and you say, well, I don't want to make any trouble, Jezebel is there and she likes to be in the forefront and she likes to publicize herself and she likes to do this and that. I won't fight for anything. If they tell me to do whatever, I will do it. But if Jezebel comes to compete with me, I'll just, you know, I'll just, uh, you know, back out and uh, bail, bail out and I'll just step down. I will not allow anybody to ruffle my, my heart or whatever. You can't do that. You need to fight the good fight of it. It is your father's work. And if you know you have a good heart, you have a good intention, you have the gift of God, you have the calling of God, you have the authority and the position and the privilege the Lord has given you, you'll not just fold your hand and keep on looking for one a woman somewhere that is not born again, that is not appointed. You are appointed. She is not appointed. Thank God you are appointed and you are here. And this work will prosper in your hand in Jesus' name. But you see, when we, when we close our mouth and we fold our hands and we allow the people that do not have Christian experiences to do the work, then the church will be spoiled and then the Lord will say, what were you looking at? You Lydia there, what were you looking at? You Mary there, what were you looking at? And you Elizabeth there, what were you looking at? And all the good women in the New Testament that we find they could have been involved here, involved there, involved there, but they are not. And so this one just came out to, to, to snatch the work away from them. This work of the Lord, nobody will snatch it away from your hand in Jesus name. I will thank the Lord that all the, church, the churches in the New Testament, they were not all like this. In the church of the New Testament, in some of the churches, you have a Mary there. In another church, you have an Elizabeth there. In another church, you have a Martha there. In another church, in the New Testament, you have a Dorcas there. Another church, you have a Lydia there. Another church, you have another good woman there. Just this isolated case now, unfortunately, in Tatira, we have a Jezebel there. I pray that, uh, you know, this will not be our kind of church in Jesus' name. Point number two, the corruption through the perversion of Jezebel. I'm reading from chapter 2 of Revelation verse 20. It says notwithstanding 
I have, a few things against thee, because thou sufferest permitted, you allow that woman Jezebel, which, uh, which calleth herself, nobody call her, which calleth herself, nobody appointed her, which calleth herself, the pastor there did not recognize her, did not recognize her position, and when, if they had any workers retreat at all, she was not invited, she was not brought in there, but she invited herself, and she just imposed herself on the people of God. And I pray that, uh, you know, anybody that is, so, that, that is so carnal, that is so sinful, in any local church that will impose herself on that local church, I pray that the pastors there will have the stamina and you will have the backbone. You have the courage to say, Jezebel, can you excuse us? When we see the grace of God in your life, we will invite you at present. Stay where you are and let us do the work. And we don't want any Jezebel to come and model up and to come and defile what God is doing. This work of God will not spoil in our hands in Jesus' name. She calls herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants and to commit fornication and to eat things sacrifice unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed. That's a bed of affliction. And them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And he says, and I will kill her converts. I will kill her followers. I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he that searches the race and the hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to their words. I pray that your words will be good works. And you have a good reward in Jesus name. Now see the Bible talks about this. Let's come back. Let's come back to uh, that uh, verse 20. Notwithstanding I have a few things against thee because thou hast so thou sufferest that woman Jezebel. That woman Jezebel. That woman Jezebel. Uh, thank God you have uh, thousands of good women, but sometimes only one woman, uh, and even a man too, a man too, you have thousands of good men. Only one man can spoil the whole thing. It's like a drop of poison in a bucket of water. It's like a drop of poison in a bottle of good medicine that can spoil the whole thing. That woman, Jezebel, what do we learn about that woman, Jezebel, number one, it was a, she was a false prophet. Number one, a false prophet. Number two, she was a foreign princess. She was not actually, as you look at the history of Jezebel in the Old Testament, she wasn't actually part of the children of Israel, but a foreign princess. Number three, a fearless persecutor. A fearless persecutor. That woman was bold. And that woman just seized the heart of Ahab and controlled Ahab. And Ahab become like a puppet. Ahab did not have any voice, did not have any stand. Ahab did not have any muscle. Ahab did not have any bone in his body. Ahab, in the, in the face of a Jezebel, did not have any backbone. That man was just a jellyfish. And anywhere Jezebel directed him, that's where he went. He went because uh, that Jezebel was a fearless persecutor. Number four, it was a, a frightening power. Frightening power. She, she manifested, she exerted such a frightening power that no other woman in that age and that period compared with that woman Jezebel. I pray that God will deliver us from such women in our church in Jesus' name. Number five, she was a fraudulent possessor. A fraudulent possessor. Whatever she wanted to possess, neighbor's vineyard, whatever, she was so fraudulent, she took it all by force. Number six, a falling pervert. A falling pervert. Her life was perverted. Her speech was perverted. Her heart was perverted. Everything about her, she was a pervert. A falling pervert. Number seven, a filthy preacher. A filthy preacher because she influenced so that with her preaching. And that woman could talk. But the power behind Jezebel was not ordinary. Whatever the power, we are going to overcome that power. Because we have a power that is greater than any power of any Jezebel in Jesus' name. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. And over all the power of the devil and nothing shall by any means hurt you in Jesus' name. Let's look at this. I said Jezebel number one was a false prophet. False prophet. Look at this. Revelation chapter 2 verse 20. 
Nevertheless, I have sworn against thee, because thou, because thou suffest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself. Christ did not call her that. God did not call her that. Heaven did not recognize her as a prophet, and even the local church did not, did not give her the title of a prophet, but she called herself a prophetess, and she was teaching and seducing my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Number one, a false prophetess. Number two, a foreign princess. Look at uh, 1 Kings chapter 16. 1 Kings chapter 16, and you'll see that this Jezebel was a foreign princess, a foreigner, a foreigner. And there are people who are foreigners to the grace of God, foreigners to the commonwealth of Israel, foreigners to the sanctification experience, foreigners to the commission the Lord has given us. And when those foreigners come, no matter their other credentials, you don't have any part in this, you are just a foreign princess or a foreign prince. We're looking at 1 Kings chapter 16, and I'm reading here from verse 30. It says, And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the seas of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbeal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. She was a foreigner. She was not part of the people of God. Isn't that why we should be careful all these people? They can't see the will of God to all these safe sisters who are here. They can't see the will of God to marry to all the safe sisters. And we're not just talking of those who are here physically in Lagos now. We have them, you know, hundreds of thousands of saved sisters and, and real children of God. And they do not have any will of God. They can't see the will of God to all the people inside. Then they go to a foreign place somewhere where people where were not sure of their salvation, were not sure of their Christian stand, have found the will of God. After all, it's my marriage. It's not just your marriage. Is a marriage would conduct in the church and whatever that wife becomes or whatever that wife is, it will affect, it will affect the church. That's why you cannot say, it's my marriage, let them leave me alone and I will do whatever I want. You will not do whatever you want. For the sake of the church, you'll not do whatever you want. For the sake of your own soul, you'll not do whatever you want. And for the sake of eternity, our destiny, you will not do whatever you want in Jesus' name. Look at Ahab. Ahab as a king over there. He could not find any, any lady in the whole of Israel to marry. And then went to the foreign land. I pray that God will save you from the foreign women in Jesus' name. Number three, I said he was a fearless persecutor. Fearless persecutor. Uh, let's look at uh, First Kings chapter 18. I'm reading here from verse 4. Here's the testimony of Abadiah. Abadiah said, For it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord. That woman was a great persecutor. And she was a fearless, bold persecutor, single-handedly, without even any support from Ahab or participation with Ahab, single-handedly by, uh, by herself, Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. The only thing you could do is just run, uh, to, to go and hide and run for shelter when Jezebel came around. And I pray that no, none of our sisters will be like Jezebel. Bold, authoritative, audacious, uncontrollable, and wicked, and bad, and hard-hearted, and stubborn to you. We will not be like that in Jesus' name. I said Jezebel, number one, was a false prophetess. Number two, she was a foreign princess. Number three, she was a fearless persecutor. And number three, she manifested frightening power frightening power and let, let's look at let's look at uh, first kings chapter 19 verses 1 and 2 first kings chapter 19 verses 1 and 2 and he have told jezebel poor ahab poor ahab ahab could not say anything to elijah 
and when the when, when when Elijah the man of God said the God that brings fire down that's the God we're going to worship and all the people said yes amen that's what we're going to do and here was there watching everything and when the fire came down the people said the Lord he is God the Lord he is God and then Elijah said take all those prophets of Baal and destroy them we're going to eradicate we're going to take away Baal worship from the land Ahab was there he couldn't say anything to Elijah and then eventually the Lord said go tell Ahab abundance of rain is coming Ahab was there and then Elijah told him he said to saddle your ass or whatever you are going to do and then run because there's a sound of the abundance of rain and the rain came and all the famine was over and then Ahab poor Ahab he didn't have a mind of his own he didn't have any understanding of his own all he could everything he had to take permission from Jezebel he had to report to Jezebel you see what happened today you see what Elijah did today you see all those prophets of Baal they are now finished he could not take he was a king, a puppet on the throne. But look at this, chapter 19, verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with that, how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods, you see, not the God of Israel. Can you think of a woman in Israel? Still, uh, still having the power of other gods, small g. Let the, so let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life among um, thy life as one of them by tomorrow about this time. When Elijah had that, what did he do? And when he saw, when he saw that he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba that belonged to Judah and left his servant there. Anybody that could frighten Elijah, that was a power. That was a woman. That was a woman. Anybody that could make Elijah to say, oh Lord, kill me. I don't want to continue ministry. Instead of allowing Jezebel to get at me and to reach me where I am, just kill me by yourself. Anybody that could, fight, that could frighten Elijah, that woman was of frightening power, terrible power, evil power. And I pray that it will not be like that with you in Jesus' name. You see, this man would have made Elijah to miss the rapture. To miss the rapture. Elijah so just said, I'm not waiting for rapture. I'm not waiting for any chariots from heaven. All I want to do now is die because Jezebel is after me. That Jezebel, you know, when you allow a woman to be so powerful in the church, in the local church, that she could threaten any Elijah and she could run Elijah out of town and run Elijah out of the region run Elijah out of the state and run Elijah out of the out of the station where you are out of the nation that's a terrible thing and when then she then she then controls anything that is done in the church that person will not be there he's not there that person will not stay there and he's not staying there frightening power and I pray that God will deliver us from that in Jesus name couldn't that church in that, couldn't they pray that woman out? Couldn't they pray her down? Couldn't they pray and say that, oh Lord, this is your work. There's a Jezebel there. Even though we don't have the words to speak to her, we can pray and we can have authority. And when we manifest that authority, we're going to prevail in Jesus' name. See those, and you see those leaders of the past, when Pharaoh rose up, they subdued Pharaoh. And when, see, when uh, this uh, person Balaam, when he rose up, they subdued Balaam. And when all, the, all those Canaanites and all the people, when they rose, they subdued them. And when you come to Goliath, they even subdued Goliath. And look at, look at Nebuchadnezzar, they subdued Nebuchadnezzar. Look at Belshazzar, they subdued Belshazzar. And then Herod eventually was eating of worms. They, they subdued Herod. How is it that they subdued all those people and just this one woman, Jezebel, they couldn't subdue in all our churches any Jezebel that tries to rise up with the unity of faith and the power of the Holy Ghost the Lord has given us will subdue every Jezebel in Jesus name this church will be strong this church will keep on standing stand up stand up for Jesus his soldiers of the cross we're going to stand on the totality of the truth the Lord has given us in Jesus name 
if any Jezebel is there in any local church that they submit and they surrender and they are subdued and then they are converted and then we move along or they are going to experience the power of God that will smash them and destroy them in Jesus name Christ, the head of the church, will not allow one Jezebel somewhere, anywhere, to subdue his church because he's building the church that the gates of hell shall not prevail against. And this church will stand in Jesus' name. Number one, she was a false prophetess. Number two, she was a foreign princess. Number three, she was a fearless persecutor. Number, th number four, she had frightening power. Number five, she was a fraudulent possessor. Fraudulent possessor. We're looking at 1 Kings chapter 21. 1 Kings chapter 21, and I'm reading from verse 7. I'm reading from verse 7. 1 Kings chapter 21, and Jezebel's wife, what a wife, what a wife. And Jezebel's wife said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of neighbors, the Jezreelites. Think about that. If we have an asset, if this man neighbor, to give me your vineyard, I'll sell it to me. Or if you don't want to sell it, exchange it. I'll give you a better vineyard. And the man said, I want to sell the inheritance of my fathers. And then eventually, Ahab, a poor Ahab, I told you, that man was like jellyfish, no backbone. He then came to his house, he wouldn't even eat. And then Jezebel said, what's the problem with you? He said, this is a problem. It's, you know, he had to depend on this Jezebel uh, for as a king no authority no voice and he couldn't even do anything except jezebel came in and then jezebel said are you not the king i will give you the, the myriad of neighbors and then she planned everything you know this story this fraudulent uh, woman and orchestrated all the things that brought a uh, neighbor to be killed and after he died look at verse 23 in verse 23 we're told and jezebel also speak um, and and of jezebel also speak the lord the dog shall eat jezebel by the wall of jezreel eventually god dealt with her god will deal with every jezebel I said God will deal with every Jezebel. Now number six, she was a falling pervert. We're looking at 2 Kings chapter 9. 2 Kings chapter 9. I'm reading here from verse 22. 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 22. She was a falling pervert. It says in verse 22, And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu. And she, that he, he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace so long as the Odoms, the, the, the adulteries of thy mother Jezebel, and her witchcraft are so many, and her witchcraft are so many. She depended not only on royal power, she depended also on occultic power, satanic power, witchcraft. Uh, witchcraft, so many. And then we're told in, uh, in that same chapter, look at verse 30. And when Jehu was, was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face. You can see that uh, witchcraft was there, worldliness was there, everything you can think of from the negative side was there in the life of this Jezebel. Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and tied her head and looked out at the window. And as Jehu entered in at the gate, she said, she said, she's always talking. She has authority to talk. Only when Jehu came, that the end came to that, the end came to that woman. I pray that God will raise up people like Jehu in every local church in Jesus' name. The people that fear no face and the people that are not timid about anyone or for anyone and they come in the strength of the Lord, in the power of the Holy Ghost and every Jezebel will be subdued in Jesus' name. And she said that a Zimri peace uh, who slew his master and he lifted up his eyes to the window and said, who is on my side? This is Jehu. I pray that that power will be in your life in Jesus' name. Who is on my side? Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs, and he said, throw her down. And eventually, our uh, uh, end came. And I pray that the end of sinning, the end of evil, the end of perpetration of immorality and witchcraft will come for every Jezebel in Jesus' name. 
But then number seven, she was a filthy preacher. We're coming back to Revelation, Revelation chapter, Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 20. And we see the influence and the impact of this uh, woman in Tatira. It says, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel who calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols and I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not behold I will cast her into a bed a bed of affliction and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation except they repent of their deeds and I will kill her children her converts her followers the people she had influenced I will kill them with death and all the churches shall know that I am he that searcheth the race and the hearts, and I will give to every one of you according to your works. That's Jezebel, a field the preacher that influenced the people in the wrong direction. Think about this Jezebel. And what was her style? What was her method? What was her ministry? What was her kind of influence? Number one, it was to contaminate, contaminate. The pure gospel had been there, the river of life, the water of life had been there. And then this woman came into that church in Tatira to contaminate the pure water of the gospel. Number two, to infiltrate, infiltrate. Just to, you know, in a sly way, in a, in a deceitful manner, to infiltrate. And then until every section of that church in Tatira had been infiltrated. Treated, and she had a combat there, a follower there, somebody else influenced over there. And before you knew what, every section of the church, in the children's section, youth section, women's section, men's section, ushers and choir and everywhere, she had her representative. She had infiltrated. Number one is to contaminate. Number two is to infiltrate. Number three is to intimidate. Intimidate. Jezebel, she had, she had a style of intimidation. And then when you find a woman, that a woman will contaminate, a woman will infiltrate and prognose into everywhere, even where she is not, where she is not called, where she is not supposed to be involved. And then she has a way of intimidating. You know that, that that's like Jezebel. And I pray that God will crush that kind of power of intimidation in Jesus' name. Number one, to contaminate. Number two, to infiltrate. Number three, to intimidate. Number four, to eradicate. Eradicate. All she wanted, all Jezebel wanted, is that the doctrine of holiness will be eradicated. And the doctrine of sanctification will be eradicated. And the doctrine of commitment unto their divine ownership, total submission to the Lord, will be eradicated. And that's what Jezebel was, wanted to do, to eradicate. And then number five, to dominate. To dominate. You will see how Jezebel Jezebel dominated Ahab. That's what every Jezebel wants to do, uh, to so take away the heart of the man and the heart of the minister so that they will dominate. And then number six is to so impersonate. Impersonate. Didn't you see? She said, I'll give you, I'll give you the, the vineyard of Naboth. And then took the signature of uh, Ahab and then sent a letter over there to impersonate. This is Ahab writing. This is the king writing. And it was Jezebel, number seven, to initiate, initiate. You see, that's what witchcraft does. They want everybody to come under the power of witchcraft. You will not come under such power in Jesus' name. Number one, to contaminate. Number two, to infiltrate. Number three, to intimidate. Number four, to eradicate. Number five, to dominate. Number six, to impersonate. And number seven, to initiate. You will not be initiated. We're going to have power over every form of oppression, over every form of intimidation in Jesus' name. I come to point number three now, command and promise for the just. The command and the promise for the just. We're looking at Revelation chapter 2. And I read here from verse 24. I'm reading from verse 24. And unto, but unto you I say, and unto the rest in Tatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put none, I will put upon you none other body, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. Do you have something? I said, Do you have anything? 
you have salvation hold fast till i come you have holiness hold fast till i come you have sanctification hold fast till i come you have the opportunity and the privilege and the credentials of serving the lord hold fast till i come and you have authority in the kingdom of god hold fast until i come you have the doctrines of the bible he has said teaching them to observe all things whatsoever i command you and lo i am with you till the end of the world hold fast till i come you have a ticket to heaven you have a ticket to the to the paradise of god because that salvation that new birth is your ticket the grace of god in your life hold fast until i come you have your family too hold fast until i come you have your children hold fast until i come you have your church privileges hold fast until i come it says in that verse 25 that which you have already you hold fast until i come he that overcometh there where again he that overcometh where are they he that overcometh you'll overcome in jesus name it says and keep it my works keep it my works unto the end to him i will give power over the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as vessels of a porter shall they be broken to shavers even as i have received of my father and i will give him the morning star it will be yours in jesus name he that has an ear to hear let him hear what the spirit says unto the churches what's the lord telling us there to overcome the temptation that is coming from Tyatara and to overcome the corruption that is coming from Tyatara. Number one, flee corruption. Flee corruption. Flee corruption. By all means, uh, Jezebel tries to get to you. Say, I'm sorry. And if uh, you, you have to do like Joseph, you leave your coat and leave whatever she's holding on to and run away for your life. And when you flee temptation, don't leave a forwarding address. That is to just flee and not say, I'm running away from you, but I'm running to Japan. I'm running away from you. I'm running to India. Don't leave a forwarding address and God will keep you safe and secure killed separated forever from jezebel in jesus name number one flee corruption number two fight compromise fight compromise fight compromise anywhere you see compromise try to get into your life either through jezebel or balaam or the nucleators you fight that compromise number three follow christ follow christ and say christ is my lord christ is my example and christ is my pattern and christ is the one i want to follow for the rest of my life you flee corruption and you fight compromise and you follow christ and on that final day when the trumpet shall sound you'll be there i will be there we will be there together in jesus name in first peter first peter chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 21 first peter chapter 2 we're reading from verse 21 for ye even here on two when ye call because christ also suffered for us leaving us an example leaving us an example leaving us a pattern a model an example that we should follow his steps if you follow jesus you will not be lost if you follow Jesus, you cannot make a mistake. You cannot go astray. That heaven, you will get there in Jesus' name. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Why don't you turn your mind away from Jezebel? Turn your heart away from Jezebel. And turn your attention away from Jezebel. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the him and he said at the right hand of the throne of God another final day when the Lord begins to call the names of the overcomers you'll be there in Jesus name let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer and say Lord I'll be there I'll be there I'll be there I just want to be like Jesus more like the master I would ever be more of his meekness more of his humility more of his zeal to labor more courage to be true more consecration for work as a bit me to do. Talk, tell the Lord, I want more, I want more. Am I saved? Get more. Am I sanctified? Get more. Are you filled with the Holy Ghost? Get more. Are you committed to the work of the Lord already? Get more. Do you have truth in your hand, in your heart already? Get more. More. More like the master. More like the master is my daily prayer. More. More strength to carry crosses. I must bear more earnest effort to bring his kingdom in. 
more of his spirit, the wanderer to win. The evangelism he has given us to do, concentrate on that. Do not allow the string of any Jezebel to pull you back and say just more, more of the master, more like the master, I will live and grow. More of his love to others will I show. More self-denial like he is in Galilee. More like the master I long ever to be. Take thou my heart, I would be thine alone. Take thou my heart and make it all thine own. Purge me from sin, O Lord, I now implore. Wash me and keep me thine forevermore. More like the master. Tell the Lord, I want to follow. I want to follow. I want to follow the Lord for the rest of my life. No looking back and no negative influence from any Jezebel. 